続きまして、えー、ローレンス・レッシグ教授にご登壇をいただきますローレンス・レッシグ教授は、えー、現在ハーバード・ロースクールの教授でいらっしゃり、えー、同大学のエドモンド・セフラー・ファウンデーション・センター・フォー・エフィックスという、えーまあえー、の、えー、理事でいらっしゃいます、えー、今年の秋にハーバード大学に移られますまではスタンフォードロースクールの教授でスタンフォードセンターフォーインターネットアンドソサエティの創始者としてご活躍でいらっしゃいましたレシグ教授は、えー、法律と技術の工作領域における研究の第一人者であられましてデジタル時代における著作権をはじめとする知的財産権のあり方やインターネットにまつわる法律問題についての先端的な研究を行って、まあ、文字通り世界中の研究者に大きな影響を与え数々の賞を受賞されたご経験が、えー、おありです。インターネット法と、えー、著作権に関するご著書としては1999年に「Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace」という本が、まあ、出て、えー、世界中に衝撃を与えたわけですが最近では2008年に「リミックス」という本が出版をされておりますまた2002年12月から「クリエイティブ・コモンズ」という、えー、私が、まあ、日本で NPO をやっている団体ですけれども、まあ、著作権をよりあのデジタルの時代に合わせて柔軟に運用しようというような、まあ、ライセンス活動をしておりまして現在世界52カ国に、えー、広がっておりますでレッシグ教授は近年、えー、ご研究の中心をより大きな問題に移されまして、えー、立法,の法律の立法過程における、まあ、倫理哲学エフィックスの問題を、えー、特に中心的にご研究をしておりまして、えー、政治家が、まあえー、選挙資金をファンドレイズするにあたって、まあ、特定の,その政策に対して、まあ、ロビーングをしている、えー、企業からの企業献金によって、まあ、コラプションという腐敗があの生じているのではないかというようなそれによって正しい公共政策が実現されていないんじゃないかというような、まあ、問題に取り組まれていらっしゃいますが本日はこのシンポジウムのために、えー特別に、まあ、著作権と、えー、科学と技術の、まあ、科学技術の情報の共有について、えー、ご講演をいただくということでご来日をいただきました、えー、本日の、えー、テーマは著作権時代のあすいませんデジタル時代の著作権と、えー、科学データの共有へのインパクトという、えー、タイトルでございますそれでは、えー、レッシグ教授よろしくお願いいたします Thank you very much and thank you for that generous introduction It omitted the most important fact about、um, my coming here, which is the extraordinary pleasure I have in returning to Tokyo University seven years after I was、uh, a guest of Professor Nakayama and had the pleasure of spending the fall of 2002 just a couple buildings over. So it's a wonderful opportunity to have the chance to return, and I'm grateful to you for that. I want to start with some observations, three. Observations that I hope will frame our understanding of this question of the relationship between traditional intellectual property protections and the emerging innovative uses of data technology that we are beginning to understand. So I'm to talk about copyright, <clears throat> but I want to begin by introducing. A concept that might not translate well into Japanese. It's a saying in the United States. The saying is, we forget the elephant in the room. Now, what that saying means is, we often proceed ignoring the most significant fact that should be our attention, but somehow is missing from the debate. And I want to suggest that with respect to copyright, there is an elephant in the room. And we understand that elephant by focusing on a contrast between the past and present, between the regulation of copyright in the past and the regulation of copyright in the present. For in the past, copyright regulated an extraordinarily small slice. Of creative activities. It regulated a tiny proportion of the way that ordinary citizens engaged in cultural and scientific activity. As Professor Jessica Lipman put it in a fantastic article titled 
the exclusive right to read. At the turn of the century, US copyright law was technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand, but it didn't apply to very many people or very many things. If one were an author or publisher of books, maps, charts, paintings, sculpture, photographs, or sheet music, a playwright or a producer of plays, or a printer, the copyright law bore on one's business. Booksellers, piano roll and phonograph record publishers, motion picture producers, musicians, scholars, members of Congress, and ordinary consumers, however, could go about their business without ever encountering a copyright problem. Then things changed radically. Because in the present, copyright now reaches an extraordinary range of ordinary activities that before it never would have touched. Again, as Jessica Lippin puts it, 90 years later, US copyright law is even more technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand. More importantly, it touches everyone and everything. Technology, heedless of the law, has developed modes that insert multiple acts of reproduction and transmission, potentially actionable events under the copyright statute, into commonplace daily transactions. Most of us can no longer spend even an hour without colliding with the copyright law. Now, why is it there was this explosion in the reach of copyrights application. It's a technical reason. A technical reason having to do with the architecture of copyright law and the architecture of digital technologies. If at its core, copyright regulates something called, quote, copies, then in the analog world, Many uses of creative works are copyright free, meaning they don't trigger copyright. But in the digital world, very few uses of creative work are copyright free, meaning triggering copyrights regulation. Practically all such uses now trigger the application of copyright law. So think very practically about a book, for example, in physical space. If these are all the potential uses of a book, an important set of these uses are just technically unregulated by the law of copyright. So to read a book is not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to read a book does not produce a copy. To give someone a book is not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book, because to give someone a book is not to produce a copy. To sell a book under American copyright law is explicitly exempted from the reach of copyright's protection, because to sell a book is not to produce a copy. And nowhere does copyright law purport to regulate sleeping on a book, because to sleep on a book is not to produce a copy. These ordinary uses are unregulated by the law, and then the law of copyright had a set of uses which it did regulate in order to create the necessary incentives to produce great new work. So you want to publish a book, you need permission from the copyright owner because that monopoly right was deemed essential to the opportunity to produce that work originally. And then in the American tradition, and some of us hope in other traditions too, there was a thin sliver of exceptions called fair uses. Uses which otherwise would have been regulated by the law, but which the law says ought to remain free. Unregulated, regulated, and fair uses. Enter the internet, where every single use produces a copy. 
That means that the balance between unregulated, regulated, and fair uses radically changes merely because the platform through which we get access to our culture has changed. This is a change in the way copyright law functions, a radical change. And the critical point to recognize is it's a change not because anybody sitting in this building or anybody sitting in this building passed a law saying the law ought to reach this broadly. It changed simply because the technology changed. This is the elephant in the room. We need to recognize this was a law developed for a radically different objective that is being applied now unthinkingly across a wide range of contexts that it was not designed to serve. This is an axe being used as a scalpel. That's observation number one. Here's observation number two. We have a concept in uh, English called the concept of a paradigm case. The case a law was thinking of when the law was designed. So in the Constitution of the United States, we have the Fourth Amendment that has protection against unreasonable searches and seizures. Actually, it looks more like that in the original version. The paradigm case that the Fourth Amendment was thinking of was the case of authorizing a search because of a search warrant and the context of a trespass when a police officer enters your land. The framers were not thinking much about a wiretap where, of course, no trespass is necessary. That was just not within their contemplation. Or think about Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, the clause that allows Congress to declare war. The paradigm case of war that they had in their head was this, troops on a battlefield fighting it out. They didn't much think about wars related to people like this. That just wasn't what they were thinking about. Or Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, the focus of this talk today, the Copyright Clause, actually the clause to promote the progress of science, the Progress Clause. The Copyright Clause has come to have its own paradigm case. It's concerned with creators like this, or creators like this, or creators like this. It's concerned with professionals, Professionals who depend upon an exclusive right, meaning the legal right to control copies or distribution of their work as part of their business model of creativity. Their business model is focused essentially on profit, using copyright as a means to secure that profit. That's what we mean by professional musicians or professional artists. And the assumption of copyright law is that if we don't secure enough profit to these creators, we're going to get less of their creativity. That was the paradigm case that the law was focused on when originally crafted. But obviously, right, this is obvious, not all creators function according to the same business model of creativity. As with the Fourth Amendment or the War Powers Clause, copyright's paradigm case ignores important cases, just doesn't think about them. So, for example, think about amateur creators, by which I don't mean people who are amateurish, I mean people who do it for the love of their creativity and not for the money. These are creators, they produce creativity. This creativity is critical to our culture. In my culture, it was more critical in the past. Here's Aldous Huxley in 1927, quote, in the days before machinery, men and women who wanted to amuse themselves were compelled in their humble way to be artists. Now they sit still and permit professionals to entertain them by the aid of machinery. It is difficult to believe 
that general artistic culture can flourish in this atmosphere of passivity. Where about 20 years before, this man, John Philip Sousa, said essentially the same things at the United States Capitol when he had been invited to testify about this technology, the phonograph. As he said, these talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy, in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution, as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. Now it's this picture I want you to think about, this picture of young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. It's a culture where people are active rather than passive in their relationship to culture. It's a culture where amateur creativity is an essential part. It's a culture which this professional musician, John Philip Sousa, the most important composer and performer of his era, it's a culture that this professional deemed essential to the spread of culture inside America. That is our past. I think it's actually more vibrant in your culture than it is in mine today. I love the examples of doujinshi, which of course flourish here in Japan, an example of amateur culture that parallels a professional culture, vibrant, important part of how culture spreads. My point is that these two are creators. They too have their own business models. They have an ecology within which they create. But the exclusive rights model is not that ecology. These creators create by sharing and critiquing and building upon and playing upon other people's creativity and excluding people from the right to do that is not part of their ecology. Now here's the point. It is to recognize all creativity happens within its own particular ecology. Each ecology has a business model associated with it. These business models differ. And the model of copyright appropriate for one may be harmful to another. That's the second observation. Here's the third. So I'm, I am always surprised by the respect that non-lawyers have for the law. I'm not saying you shouldn't respect the law, and I'm certainly not saying you shouldn't obey the law, but it's just surprising how deferential non-lawyers are to the law. Because lawyers, in particular law professors, have no similar respect for the law. In our view, we approach the law with skepticism. And we constantly ask the question, does this law make sense? And we never presume that it makes sense. We always examine whether it makes sense. And where it does make sense, then good. And where it doesn't make sense, we argue it should change. Now, this is especially so, I think, with copyright. Especially so because of the radical change in the scope and reach of copyright law, a change unintended by the framers of copyright, unplanned by the legislatures. So it is especially so here that we should have this skepticism. Skepticism, not disrespect. Skepticism that asks the law to prove itself. That's observation three. That's the ending of the observations. Here's the argument, point 
one of this argument. I want to think here, talk here a little bit about the ecology of creativity inside of science. What does it look like? What is the business model of science? What is the ethos of the scientist? The famous sociologist Robert Merton had a very clear conception of that ethos. He called it communistic. As he said, in the non-technical and extended sense of common ownership of goods. As he described, the substantive findings of science are a product of social collaboration and are assigned to the community. They constitute a common heritage in which the equity of the individual producer is severely limited. Property rights in science are whittled down to a bare minimum by the rationale of the scientific ethic. The scientist's claim to his intellectual property is limited to that of recognition and esteem, which, if the institution functions with a modicum of efficiency, is roughly commensurate with the significance of the increments brought to the common fund of knowledge. Eponymy, for example, the Copernican system or Boyle's law is thus at once a mnemonic and commemorative device. Now, Burton's point was not that we have to be communists in order to be scientists, right? That wasn't what he was claiming. His point instead is that the ecology, the business model of science, does not depend upon exclusive rights. That the ecology of creativity is different from the ecology of Britney Spears' creativity. It is closer to the ecology of creativity that John Philip Sousa was romanticizing. It's not that incentives are irrelevant. Of course they're irrelevant. It's that the incentives function differently. And the quid pro quo of the exclusive right can actually be harmful to the ecology of knowledge within science. So the point is a point which has been known from, by property theorists from the very beginning, including perhaps in the law the most important property theorists, the conservative Nobel Prize winning economist Ronald Coase. As he wrote in what I think of as his most important article, quote, all property rights interfere with the ability of people to use resources. What has to be ensured is that the gain from that interference more than offsets the harm it produces. So copyright, in the model of Britney Spears, in my view, in the context of science, produces more harm than good. Point one, point two. So if this is so, or at least if this skeptical attitude is so, then you would expect a certain resistance. A certain resistance to imposing this model of copyright upon the scientist. Not a rejection of copyright, but a resistance. An approach that skeptically asks and demands proof before this foreign, imperialist model for regulating gets imported upon the scientist. But if you'd expect that skepticism, you'll be disappointed. Because rather than resistance, the past 20 years, as very helpfully articulated in the previous presentation, have been dominated by an extraordinarily simplistic ideal enacted in the name of these two senators, Senator Bai and Senator Dole. The Bai-Dole ideal, which is to simply embrace this simple quid pro quo model in the field 
of science. And that idea has captured the paradigm. Creativity according to the model of these people has been imposed with little resistance on science with too little skepticism demonstrated by experts within science. Too few have had the courage to express that skepticism openly and forcefully. So my objective in flinging myself across the Pacific, beyond the pleasure of coming back to Tokai, uh, to, uh, Todai University, has been to ask you to stop this. To stop believing, to stop listening, to stop deferring, to feel entitled as scientists to questioning the way the law regulates you. Indeed, I'm here to deliver to you this certificate of entitlement. The bearer of this certificate, trained in the field of science, is hereby officially entitled to question whether copyright law as currently crafted makes sense for science. And I'm happy to send you a signed copy of this. <laughs> Lawrence Lessig, professor of law, Harvard University. You can hang it on your wall. It is an entitlement for you to say, does this system make sense? Because the point is that your deference to lawyers, to people who confuse the paradigm case with the universal case, is extraordinarily destructive of science. And you, not lawyers, have an obligation to protect science. You have an obligation to do better in protecting science than you have done so far. Now here's the question you should be asking. If there is a business model to science, one that depends upon sharing, that will increasingly depend upon sharing, as the earlier presentation made clear, that depends upon work being in the common, upon which we can build common upon which we can build without the complexity of asking permission first, does the paradigm case of copyright help this business model? So for example, in the context of scientific journals, does it help? Now the answer is, for rich American universities, the model, this paradigm case model, the Britney Spears model of copyright applied to journals doesn't matter much. We're rich enough, we can afford to buy our way out of it. You too are rich enough, you can afford to buy your way out of it. It's not gonna stop the research you do at Tokyo University, it's not gonna stop the research I do at Harvard. But the thing to think about is, what about for the rest of the world? Because a significant cost, even a nominal cost, in getting access to these journals is prohibitive to 98% of the world blocking the spread of knowledge globally. And not just in universities, think about citizens. A prohibitive cost that it imposes on citizens getting access to knowledge. I tripped upon this, here's a personal story I'll share with you, just three uh, weeks ago. We, had, uh, we were fortunate to have the birth of our third child. But on the third day of her life, there was a severe fear that she had jaundice. And the doctor, midnight on her third day, told me I had to take her into the emergency room to be tested because there was a severe condition of jaundice which could produce brain damage and he feared that she suffered from this. Well, I went to the internet on the way to the hospital to learn a little bit about this condition and because I was fortunate enough to find this article in the American Family Physician, American Family of Physician that allows you to download a full article for free, I was able to print it out and carry it with me to the emergency room. So there I was, sitting in the emergency room with my daughter, the doctor feared having brain damage version of jaundice, and I started reading this article. And I got to the critical place in the article, the part that would help me figure out whether my daughter was going to have this condition or not, and I came across this. The rights holder did not grant rights to reproduce this item in electronic media. For the missing item, see the original print version of this publication, which, as you might expect, was not accessible to me in the emergency room at the hospital. Now the point is to think, 
What possible reason do we have for organizing access to this kind of knowledge in this way? We're not talking about Britney Spears' music. We're not talking about the music, the film produced by a great Hollywood director. Why would we do it? There are plenty of important contexts where her model of creativity makes sense, but here, what are the costs? Because the costs are significant. And what is the benefit? And do the benefits here outweigh the costs? Is there something we get, as Ronald Coase put it, from the proprietary model that we couldn't get if this were made available for free? Now, journals have a long tradition of practicing the exclusive right to a journal by exercising the copyright to control access to the journal. Did that tradition make sense? I believe, of course, it did. Of course, it made sense. For the whole of the history, when journals were produced by killing trees and distributing copies on paper. In the past, that system made perfect sense. The economics of production necessitated this evil, this evil meaning restricting access. But the point to recognize is if it's an evil, even if it's a necessary evil, it's necessitated by the economics of production. And when that changes, we have to ask, is this necessary evil still evil? And if we could avoid it, should we? That's the question being asked by the open access movement in scientific publication. Its objective is to replicate the good in the old way that we produced knowledge through journals, peer review, and access, but avoid the evil, meaning the restrictions on access. So that's the objective of the Public Library of Science, to facilitate the spread of journals that though remain peer-reviewed by the very best scientists within each field, guarantee free access to the underlying scientific work, licensed in the freest possible way for people to do with as they wish. And the question, then, that this type of model raises is, this, is the question, is this evil still necessary? Now, my view is scientists have an ethical obligation to ask that question. Because the ethical obligation of a scientist, different from the ethical obligation of Britney Spears or any musician, is universal access to knowledge. Not just to produce knowledge, but to produce knowledge in a way that guarantees this universal access. And unless restrictions are necessary, then we should treat them differently. Now, the thing to recognize about lawyers answering this question is that we have not been very good at answering this question before, namely the question of how to architect access to knowledge, to guarantee permanent access to knowledge. So think, for example, about two bits of culture and the way the law has organized access to this knowledge before. First, think about books, published books. The great thing about published books and the law that governs published books is that we basically have access to every book ever published anywhere in the world. We could have access to that for free through libraries, or we could have access to that almost free through used bookstores. There is an enormous market here of creativity in publishing books, and an ecology that preserves access to those books. Because once the book is published, we can trade copies without fear of copyright regulation, and after a, quote, limited time, whatever that is, the book passes into the public domain and can be distributed freely, electronically freely now, forever. Now compare that ecology of access to our knowledge with a different ecology, access to film, a, work, a question which Professor Nakayama's early work addressed quite excellently. Film is a compilation work, meaning it's produced by compiling together a bunch of different 
creative elements, music, a story, images, all get mixed together in the production of a film. And what that means is the ability to or reuse or reuse that film is contingent upon securing permissions from the rights holders in the elements to the film. So, for example, in my book, Free Culture, I tell the story about this company, Starwave, which in the 1990s was trying to demonstrate the potential to the CD-ROM technology. Remember those old discs, CDs, that, uh, um, that uh, were thought to be the great future of access to data. And they wanted to demonstrate this by taking clips from every single film that Clint Eastwood was ever in or directed or produced and putting them together on one single CD, you know, 30-second clips from each of these films. It took Starwave's team of 12 lawyers one year's worth of work to clear the rights necessary to include these clips in this CD-ROM film. Not just copyrights, but actors' rights, every single right that might block the ability to reuse this work. And that is because of the legal architecture we have constructed around the creation of film. It gets much more complicated with documentaries. So this is one of America's greatest 20th century documentarians, Charles Guggenheim. His most famous film was a film RFK Remembered that was produced six weeks after Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated and shown nationally just once at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. His son is Davis Guggenheim, the director of Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. His daughter is a woman named uh, Grace Guggenheim, who is herself a filmmaker, but is curator of Charles Guggenheim's 100 documentaries. For the past 20 years, Grace Guggenheim has been trying to secure permissions to reproduce her father's documentary films in DVD format. Now, why would it be so complicated? to secure that permission. Well, documentaries are often filled with snippets of film taken from other sources. So for example, 60 seconds taken from CBS in a documentary about civil war, uh, about uh, civil rights movement. And when that 60 second clip was taken, there would be a contract or a license written up by the lawyers. And it would say something like, first of all, you agree your only right to use this is governed by this license. You don't pretend that fair use gives you the right to use this in your film. And secondly, this license grants you, for example, five years North American educational use for this clip, and that's it. And what that means is that after five years, you're not going to be able to distribute this film unless you can go back to the original licensors and get permission to redistribute the film. So this was dramatically demonstrated to cause enormous trouble in the most important series about civil rights uh, movement in uh, the United States, Eyes on the Prize, as described by John, John Else, one of the producers of this film. It is virtually the only audiovisual purveyor of the history of the civil rights movement in America, but because more than 50% of the film is taken from archival shots, including an extraordinary amount of music that had to be licensed independently, it will cost $500,000 to re-up the rights to make it available on DVD platform. Now, what that means is the vast majority of documentary films in the United States will literally disappear because they are on nitrate-based stock that will dissolve after 20 years and no one will have the economic interest or opportunity to clear the rights necessary to make that work accessible beyond the limited term of its original production. Now think about the difference then between books and documentary films. The difference is produced by the regime of rights under which each of these were created. That regime was perfectly fine when the work was created for the purpose of creating the work. Didn't matter. But the point is, it's radically different, indeed a disaster, when we think about preserving access and reuse of those works. 
because with respect to books, we have perpetual access and reuse. With respect to documentary films, we have none. And that difference is a choice. It was made by people, made by lawyers, people who were not thinking about this future technological opportunity of DVDs that would make it extraordinarily easy to guarantee access to this work. They weren't thinking about it when they originally made the work. And what that means is the regime they created blocks our legal access to that work. Now we're beginning to see the same kind of blockage in the context of science. So for example, you might know of this extraordinary institute, the Allen Institute for Brain Science. They have this database of what they say is transgenic mouse study, which provides a comprehensive characterization of expression patterns of genetically controlled markers in the brains of transgenic mice. I'm sure that means something. I have no clue what that means, but I'm sure it's very important. Now, the people at uh, uh, Science Commons, um, we we'll describe in a second, thought, what if we took all that data and scraped it from their site and dumped it into Google Maps? so that we could begin to map all these markers in a way that would make it meaningful. And they produced these extraordinary models of all of these markers mapped using Google Map and all the functionality of Google Maps. So they thought, why couldn't we do this generally? Why people wouldn't do this generally? And they showed it to, Alan, to the people at Allen, and they thought this was fantastic. And then the lawyers looked at it and said, well, the reason we can't do it is that all the data in the Allen database is governed by licenses which forbid search engine-like technologies from taking advantage of this sort of data. So the point to see is that we're beginning to turn, take the model of documentary films and extend it to science. We're taking the model of defining exclusive rights so carefully that it can't take account of unanticipated future uses and shifting it to science so that all of the extraordinary innovations, again, I think beautifully described in the first presentation this morning, become technically illegal. Now, illegality does not scale well. We can't build a generation of scientific research on top of illegal acts. And so we need to find ways to act to avoid these legal thickets that are going to block the opportunity for science to progress. So that's the argument. Here's what I think we should do. So we've tried to help in this process. 2002, I flew back from Tokyo University to San Francisco to celebrate the launch of Creative Commons. Creative Commons was meant to be a simple way for authors, authors, not users, creators and authors, to mark their content with the freedoms they intended the content to carry. So rather than the default of all rights reserved, this was a some rights reserved model, signaling the rights the author kept and the rights the author was waiving. So in the model that we set up, there are certain freedoms that you could give, the freedom to share the work, the freedom to remix the work, or both, subject to certain limitations, the limitation that you can only do it for non-commercial purposes or share alike, meaning you have to give people the right to do to your creative work what you did to mine, or both. You made the selection of freedoms and limits, and you got a license. And there's a range of these licenses, from the freest, simply requiring attribution, to the most restrictive. Now, each of these licenses comes in three layers. There's a human-readable commons deed, which expresses the freedoms associated with the, light, the content in ways that ordinary people should understand. You get to this deed by clicking on the icon next to the content. Then at the bottom, if you click on the license link, you then get into a lawyer-readable license, a billion-page document written by some of the best uh, lawyers we could find, including Yuko here for Japan, um, that would make the freedoms enforceable associated with the content. 
And then most importantly, in my view, a machine-readable expression of the freedoms associated with the content, expressed in RDF that makes it easy for machines to begin to identify the content that is subject to those freedoms. And since we launched this project in 2002, we've had an enormous uptake in licenses, hundreds of millions of objects out there licensed under Creative Commons licenses, including more than 100, images, 100 million images at Flickr, Artists from Jonathan uh, Colton to Nine Inch Nails releasing their work under Creative Commons licenses. Al Jazeera producing an extraordinary archive of video which is all available freely under the most uh, least restrictive Creative Commons license. The White House which has made all of its content available now under Creative Commons licenses and just last year Wikipedia which relicensed Wikipedia under Creative Commons licenses to join into this ecology of freedom. But in 2005, we decided we would take these ideas and extend them specifically into the context of science by launching the Science Commons Project. And the objective of the Science Commons Project was to lower the transaction costs of sharing in the context of science by building infrastructure to enable this sharing. The simplest way to do that was in the context of open access, which would just use copyright licenses we had developed elsewhere. So we framed an open access um, uh, technology, and now more than a thousand journals um, that are open access journals use the Creative Commons licenses. We did it as well in the context of data. The objective meaning to build a legal infrastructure to eliminate unnecessary legal restrictions around data. Now these are actually more freedoms than granted under the copyright licenses. We created something called the CC0 protocol, which is a protocol to basically say, I waive all possible rights that I might be granted, whether database rights or copyrights or whatever rights you might think I have, I waive them with respect to this data. So that's a legal infrastructure for removing all questions that researchers might have about the ability to use data, and then a technical infrastructure to enable sharing around this using, again, RDFA technologies to make it simple to build the infrastructure of a semantic understanding of this underlying data. And then third, the Science Commons has launched efforts at opening the ability to share materials, not virtual things, but real physical things through this material transfers agreement that just like the license has three layers making it simple for people to move stuff between scientific labs at the minimum complication that lawyers would be involved. Now the aim of all of these projects is simply to simplify sharing among scientists. Simplify to encourage the ethic that Merton spoke about that defines how scientists function. So my favorite recent example is something you might be familiar with, the Personal Genome Project which is going to enable an enormous amount of research into genomics. Um, they will produce a gene sequence for individuals. They now have 10. They have more than 1,000 that have cleared the volunteer uh, level to begin to do this. A full gene sequence. Medical information, not their medical files, but medical information produced through interviews from each of these people. And stem cells for each of these people, available to scientists anywhere to use. The gene sequence will be under a CC0 protocol, the medical information will be under CC0 protocol, and the stem cells will be under a material transfer agreement to facilitate the easy transfer of these automatically according to these licenses. So full access to an open data protocol to produce information around what may be the most important uh, genetic uh, uh, data that we will have. Now, what Creative Commons is not, is not a movement against intellectual property. We're against intellectual property where it does no good. Where good means advances the objectives in this context of science. And where intellectual property is needed, we think it just should be used, does a fantastic job where needed, but where it's not needed, we want to find ways to work around it. And it's not only that we're not against intellectual property, we're actually for it, uh, where we can think about ways to make it function efficiently in the IP system. And my view is the IP system maximizes the benefit and minimizes the harm when it deploys an essential device 
that is necessary to deal with unintended consequences of changes in technologies. Now, this device is what we refer to as the fair use provision in a Copyright Act. The fair use provision is often argued about as if it's about your right to get something for free. So does fair use give you the right to copy Britney Spears' music for free on your computer and then on your car, CD, and wherever else? That's one important question of fair use. But I think the more important question for fair use is to see the way fair use functions as an essential tool of flexibility in the market. What it does is it permits an exception from the way the market functions, recognizing that in some places, the market is not going to work well. And it minimizes the cost of the imperfect system in those contexts where it won't work well, especially in contexts where the use was not originally anticipated. So again, think back to the example from the first presentation of taking tables of context and indexes from textbooks and using them to understand underlying data. It's not just that permission would not easily be obtained from the publishers for this use, it's that they never would have even thought of this particular use in that context. And if we required permission first, it means we can't experiment with these new uses. Instead, fair use provides a mechanism to facilitate this, this new innovative use. So especially for new innovative uses, and I want to say especially given the elephant standing in the room, the radical change in copyright's reach. Because if we had a stable, constant system of copyright, no changes in technology, it may be that this exception is unnecessary. But where we have this radical change in technology, my view, this requires infrastructure to deal with change. And fair use is that infrastructure. Let me say one thing in ending. You need to recognize that we lawyers are blinded by a particular paradigm. You need to recognize that we don't recognize the obvious. That this regime that was built for the likes of Britney Spears is not necessarily sensible for the likes of people like this. That's not to question copyright. It is to question copyright in this uber alles sense, copyright that should apply in the same way in every context of creativity. That is the challenge we make. Now, who should make that challenge? My view, it's scientists. Scientists need to feel entitled to question the law here. They need to recognize the insanity in the current way the law applies and insanity pushed by people like us lawyers. Insanity. The sort of insanity that leads you not to recognize the elephant in the room. Thank you very much.